so we cry out our praise to you. Come on, let's give an offering of praise to God. Let's worship the Lord. Let's give Him glory. He's worthy of all the praise. Father, we thank you that everything that we are is your fuel. Thank you that you have made us in your image and your likeness. Thank you, God, that you love us, love us so much. And we are here today. Instruct us, O oh Lord, equip us, and bless us one more time. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 Let's give another offering of praise. Thank you, guys. It's nice to be here. Okay. <laughs> Indeed, it's nice to be here. The next coming month, I think it's a month that can never be missed, even if um, you are so blind. It's Women's Month. And um, yes, we celebrate women in this church, and we celebrate women in our families. We celebrate women where we work. Is that not so? Isn't it? Now, there is one thing that I have come to learn in life of reality, reality, the way God has made us. I think if you take care of your mother, if you take care of your sisters, if you take care of the girls in your class, the ladies in your lecture room, whatever it is, wherever you go, if you just take care of the females, you are going to be taken care of so well. Eh? You are going to be taken care of so well in many, many ways. You might not need to carry a scarf to work or to college, whatever it might be. Because women are natured to nature. Amen to that. Our world is learning and our men in this church are learning from the past months. And uh, we continue to learn. And this afternoon we are going to meet and continue to learn. And I want to say this um, is uh, spilling out the beans a little bit. Not the beans, but I'm spilling up something that is good. The men are preparing something wonderful for Women's Month. <laughs> wow, wow. Let me not say what it is because Mr. Taita might not be happy for me. So in preparation to our Women's Month, which is coming the month of August, I want to encourage all the ladies who are here, both young girls, you know, from kindergarten to our seniors that are here, just be in church in the month of August. Amen. And we're going to, we're going to be blessed. <laughs> we're going to be blessed. Women are going to be speaking and teaching us. And some of us as the men, we're going to take care of other things. But may, may not it only be just a month, but it's a month of just awareness but it is every single day that we take care of the female counterparts in our lives. Amen. In a country or in a world where uh, violence against children and women is so rampant, I think we need to stand up not only to put up a message, but to change and transform whatever we can so that life may happen. Therefore, in preparation of the Women's Month, I'm going to be speaking to you in the next coming three weeks uh, from the book of Ruth, one of my favorite, favorite books in the Old Testament. And just learn from these two women, uh, Ruth and Naomi, uh, the significance, the beauty, uh, the struggles they experienced, and how uh, God brought them to an expected end in their lives. So journey together with me, even at home, you read the book of Ruth, it's only four chapters, if you read it this afternoon by, by 4 o'clock, you'll be actually finished. And then you read it again over and over, and let us come and learn together. So today, I just want to talk to you on the title, A Woman of Worth. A Woman of Worth. And the, the scripture we read is Ruth chapter 1, verse 1 to 22. And we have heard the story. I want you to have this at the back of your mind. What do I mean and what am I trying to bring across when I say a woman of worth, particularly uh, coming to Ruth and even also Naomi? For me, as I listened to the reading of this chapter, 
there is something that is so unique about this young woman, Ruth. She was very young, uh, going back together with the mother-in-law to a land that she does not know. Ruth becomes so worth in the sense that she chooses to follow the God of the Hebrew people of which her own people did not know. But she came to know as a result of her marriage into the Hebrew family. So she becomes worth to me because of that decision to leave everything behind and follow the God Yahweh of the Hebrew people. She becomes worth in the sense that she puts herself at risk in faith to go to a land that is not of her own with a mother-in-law who is bitter and angry and just to expect life out of nothing. A woman of worth is a woman would, is not defined by present circumstances. A woman of worth is a woman who is not pulled down by present pain in her life. But a woman of worth is a woman who looks beyond the circumstances and sees future possibilities in everything. Every time I talk about this, about women and I talk this kind of statement, I'm just reminded of my mother. Uneducated, holding no college degree, no certificate, did not even finish primary, but yet she was able to provide and to work so hard and send her children to school. Every time there seems to be nothing at home, she would create something out of nothing. And I think as I'm saying this, you can say the same thing about your mothers, isn't it? uneducated, no college degree, but yet so rich in knowledge and in wisdom. Why? Because of the great confidence of God in their lives, knowing that God can make them become able out of painful circumstances, out of difficult circumstances, to look into the future. Many of us, if our mothers were not being able to look into the future with the help of God, we wouldn't be where we are. So women don't only just matter. Women are so important in our lives. Amen to that. So there was a famine in the land of Israel. A man by the name Elimelech journeys with his family from Bethlehem to go to Moab. Now I want you to understand that the Moabites were not supposed to be associated with the Hebrew people. They were just enemies in worship, enemies spiritually, although they were the descendants of Lot. And so Elimelech runs away from Bethlehem and goes to Moab in search for a better life because there was famine in Bethlehem. Bethlehem was also known even in that particular time as the breadbasket of Israel. That's agriculture. And that's where things happened in terms of produces. But at that period of time, there was such a heavy famine, such that there was so much hunger, and people decided to find life. I do not know if there are some other people who left Bethlehem, but there could be a likelihood of that. But Elimelech, maybe possibly, he had the economical power, maybe he was a rich man, he was able to relocate his family and go to Moab. So, for me, Elimelech seems to have lost confidence in the God of provision, and he leaves the land of promise. In Moab, we learn that Eli lost his life. His sons then marry Moabites women, Ruth and Oprah, but also the sons die eventually. Now, with her husband's death and the death of her two sons, there is nothing that is left for Naomi but a tragic life of abject poverty. Because in those days, once you are a widow, not many people really took care of you. Widows were always outcasts. And I'll try to imagine <coughs> Naomi is a widow. And in a foreign land, 
amongst the people that doesn't like her. You can try to imagine the kind of life that she started living. Maybe there were nights that she would cry and say, why me, Lord? There were nights that she could cry and say, I miss home. Yet two daughters-in-law could not do so much because they also relied upon her. I try to imagine the kind of persecution, the kind of xenophobic tendencies, the kind of even treatment as a widow that she was subjected to. It can only lead to nothing but bitterness and anger and frustration. And this woman is saying, my life is finished. Ten years have passed and uh, the famine in Israel eventually is over. She, is she has got knowledge and she has word that actually God has remembered the God's people and the famine is over. Naomi and the two daughters-in-law, all three now widows, are at a critical crossroads. First with a major decision. She has got to choose to go back home. And maybe at least my house is still there. She was a good woman. Maybe life is still there. So Naomi chooses to return home to Bethlehem. She told Ruth and Opa to remain in Moab because that was the right thing to do. If there is not any husband or husband is died, you go back to your family. She gives them her blessing and say, go back to your people. At least you've got life here. Opa chooses to remain in Moab, but Ruth clings. Ruth says, ah, 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 ah. You are my mother. I will not remain here. I will go with you. If we read verse 16 together. Let's read together. Verse 16. Do not urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. Ruth decides to cling to a mother-in-law. In verse 16, I find the uniqueness of Ruth. I find the worthiness of Ruth. Because eventually we know the story that happened later. That as a result of this choice and this decision, God blesses Ruth amongst the Hebrew people such that she is honored by God to be the ancestor of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. I'm saying this so that you may know that at the end of Ruth's life, there was so much bliss. But let's just concentrate here today, when they are at the crossroads, when life is not happening. Ruth makes a decision to say, your God will be my God, your people will be my people. Now the question may be, how did she come to make that decision? And how did she love to go with a mother-in-law into a country where she's going to be a foreigner and she does not even know if life is going to happen so well for her, living her own father, your own brothers, your own country, where, where, where everything is there. But yet she says, your God will be my God. I want to believe that as a result of a marriage, to one of uh, Naomi's sons, Ruth was grafted into the Hebrew family. And as it happens in marriage, that if you get married to somebody, you incarnate with their family. You get to know everything about that family. You get to do things together with that family. The God of that family becomes your God. You get to hear the history of that family, their beliefs, what makes them tick, what they like doing. You just become part of that. And I believe that one of the things that Ruth became part with was the God of Naomi, the God of her husband. Maybe together with her husband, they used to take some walks and talking, and the husband would be telling him, and in, in Bethlehem, we worship the God Yahweh, and this God is great, and this God is mighty. He's a God who changes things. Maybe now and then, as they were strolling and uh, having their lovey-dovey moments and times, he would be telling you about his God. And Naomi was grafted into this God of the Hebrew people. I don't believe that she just says, your God will be my God without a knowledge of what God it is. Therefore, Ruth makes a decision out of the knowledge of God, Yahweh, and she does so again in faith. 
So Naomi claims that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Let's just look at Naomi a little bit because she's sort of the center of um, um, the worthiness of Ruth. If we want to understand how Ruth is so worthy, we need to understand also what makes Naomi. Naomi, who is the key leader in here, claims that in verse 18, the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. She wrongly assumes that God is against her. And it is understandable to feel like Naomi when life hurts. Why does she say the God is God gone against me? She comes in happy in Moab. Life was happening. The husband dies. Life sort of happens. The son dies. And then she's left with nothing. And all this can only allude you to say, life is unfair. And it's true, fellows. You can understand Naomi, especially if the odds of life rises up against you. You have been fired away from job, or maybe you have lost your job, you have lost your money, you have lost your business, you have lost the things, and nothing is working around you. You can't just jump up and you say, Hallelujah, I've just lost my job. For sure, the tendency of us is to go sour and to go angry. And, and Naomi is angry at God and she's angry at life and she says, God has turned against me. How many women that are seated here and even including men, who has got a sense and a feel in your life that maybe God is not with you or God has abandoned you or God has left you. Things are not working the ways you want them to work. You are angry. Yes, of course, you can't express it, but deep down in yourself, you have sleepless nights, crying and saying, God, why me? Why me? Or even saying, when is it going to be, God, that I'm going to make breakthroughs in life? When is it going to happen? You see, our problem most of the time is that we get to focus so much on our pain such that we are unable to look beyond the pain so that we can see God's purpose in everything. That's the challenge to many of us. Ruth was also subjected to whatever Naomi was experiencing because she had already lost. But there's something significant about Ruth that she's able to see that there could be a future in this God of the Hebrew people. My mother-in-law is complaining, but I think there, is, there could be something that God, something is boiling, something is tickling it within itself to say, just believe in this God, believe in this God. I want to encourage all the mothers and women that are here that do you know, it just takes that little faith that you have in yourself, that no matter how much you've been beaten down, that little voice, small voice that says to you, just keep on waking, it shall be okay. It takes listening to that voice that you can navigate through the most difficult circumstances. Our problem is that we define our life by the present pain, present circumstances. If you have heard God speaking to you about your purpose, about your future, about your plans, you pray and you hear God speaking to you. There are many of us who hear God speaking to us. He lays it into our heart. We sense that what we want to do is really, really God's will. But then the circumstances around you are totally opposite of what you want to do. Maybe it's a business, but there's no money. Maybe you want to study, but there's no opportunity. Whatever it may be. You know that God is saying turn right, turn left, but the circumstances, when you interpret them, they are not favorable. I challenge you today that as much as you have heard God speaking to you, do not allow yourself to be defined or to be stopped by present pain or present circumstances. Ask God to help you to have eyes that look beyond the pain, beyond the circumstances. Where do you get those eyes? That's the doing of God. That's that thing that God puts into your life while this you are praying and you hear that voice and saying, things, things might be not as you want them to be because most of the time anyway, things are not always as we wish, as we want them to be. 
But he have this understanding that behind the scenes, there is a God who is working. If somebody had come to Naomi and told you and said, Naomi, man, just put up your game together. Don't you know that one day you are going to be the ancestor of the Messiah, Jesus Christ? She would have dropped everything and said, oh, okay, I, I'm going to act wise. Okay, in Bethlehem, we're going to have good life. But you see, God never tells us the details of tomorrow. God never tells us the details of 10 years to come. He tells us what we need to hear today which enables us to make the next step. The rest of the things we do so by faith and trusting that he is Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, the God who provides in due course when the need rises. That's why the scripture says, let us uh, approach the throne of grace in prayer with great boldness all the time, praying so that we may uh, attain the strength and the power of God, provided one day we will need the strength of God, then we are going to find the grace in time of need. You pray today, but the need is going to be 10 years. You pray today, but the need is going to be two weeks that's why women, we've always been in prayer, irregardless of the situations, they become victorious for their children, for their families. How many today feel that God has left you? <laughs> How many of you feel that God has left me? Ruth saw something in Naomi, which Naomi could not see herself. Okay? Are you getting it? Naomi is bitter. Naomi is angry. Now, now, just look at this. My picture of Naomi always is service, but that time she was of age. But it's obvious she was a wealthy woman. They were very wealthy. That's why they were able to relocate. When she goes back, she says, I went full, but I came back empty, which means to say, I mean, she had things. Not again when she arrived in Bethlehem, the people say, is that Naomi? Which means to say she didn't look the way she left. Maybe when she left, she had Brazilian, yeah. <laughs> but when she was coming back, mm, she wasn't looking the same. So it tells me that she was a woman of elegance. She was a woman who had it all together. But when life played differently, she lost everything. And she did not look so well. But even while she's looking like that, Ruth does not see Naomi the way Naomi sees herself. Do you know, women, can I say this to you? Ruth chose to trust God. Definitely, if she was going to define things by the mouth and the words of your mother-in-law and how your mother-in-law looks, she was also going to be discouraged. That's why in the scripture, verse 16, she says, your God will be my God, your people will be my people. She didn't, say, she didn't want to talk too much about Naomi. She just said, whatever you're going to eat, whatever people you're going to meet, they're going to be my people. Your God is going to be my God. Because Ruth was concerned of the God that was in Naomi. More than she was concerned about the way Naomi looked. Here's the thing. You need all the time in your life a Ruth. A Ruth is that person who sees beyond your pain, who sees beyond your discouragement. That friend whom you walk together with, that woman whom you pray together with, who tells you that you are now not focused, who tells you believe in what you believed first, who tells you that there is a bright light coming in your path. Every woman needs a Ruth in your life. Someone who is going to believe in the God that you worship, even when you lose it. You know why? Because times in life comes when life does not deal as favorably. And circumstances might just drive you nuts. And if you don't have someone to anchor your faith on, if you don't have anybody to lean on, you might just find it so difficult to navigate through certain things. I've come to learn that women that are very strong, women that are very successful, women that are very powerful, women that are very generous, 
women that are making it through life are women that have got other roots in their lives. Are women who allow other women to speak into their lives. Are women who allow other women to show them when they can't see. For men, I know that it's difficult for me for, you, for me to say have a root in your life, but you need someone who is like Ruth in your life. Someone who sees the light when you don't see it. Do you know that it happens in life? There are some times when things are so dark in my life, I can't even see the light. You can just come to me and say, but you need to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I'll tell you, I can't even see the tunnel itself. It happens in life. But then comes somebody who can see what you can see. That's what we see. That's what makes Ruth a woman of wealth. She does not allow to define her life and her mother's law in life according to the present circumstances, according to their titles as widows. She refused to be a, 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 a widow who does not have a future. Hence, she says, I'll go with you. Hence, she says, your God will be my God. She's believing in a God. Naomi returns to Bethlehem what? Bitter and empty woman. She's greeted with cries of disbelief, as I've said in verse 19. The people say, can this be Naomi? Truly, truly, truly. I think the women were going to fetch water, whatever they saw, because every time when you are coming in, according to those villages, people would actually see you at the entrance. And when they say a donkey or whatever, and two women that are walking, they wonder, who can that be? And when they saw, they saw, that looks like Naomi. She ain't looking fine. She has got another woman with her. And, and the, the, some version says, says what? There was sort of like a, a noise within the village to say Naomi is back. This woman was not just an ordinary woman. Do you get what I'm saying, church? I mean, there, there are some people that you, you know it even in your family. If you are not that important, even if you have been away for two years. And when you arrive, people will come and knock and say, ha! You are here. We never heard that. No, I've been here for two months. Two months? Ah, we'll come back. But there are some people that, while they're still on the journey coming back, coming, people want to know when are they arriving. You know those visitors that come to visit you, that has never visited your family, but when they hear that you are just there, every morning they are coming because they know that you brought butter and jam and things, whatever it is. Because you are just important. It shows us that Naomi was no just ordinary person. But again, I want to say this to you. Even if she left full, she comes back empty. That's the realities of life. Do you hear what I'm saying, young women? When every time we say, don't, don't be proud about whatever you have and forget God. Because life has got a way to play on us, all of us. You may be at the top of the ladder today, but tomorrow you may be just down and you just don't know what happened. That's the realities of life. But if you stay in the game of worshiping God, if you stay in the lane of always in God, even if when you come down, you will know that you can go up. As Micah says, don't laugh at me, don't scorn at me or when I'm cast down because I'm going to rise up again. You can only say so if you know that you are still in the lane of walking with God. She is greeted with cries of disbelief. And Naomi, whose name means sweet or pleasant, she refuses their welcome, telling them instead, don't call me Naomi. I'm not even worth to be called sweet. Call me Mara, which means bitterness. You see how, how bitterness does and how dejection does? It can reduce you to the point that you don't feel like you are worth to exist. That's what happens when, when life is not working. We feel like as if it's not worth to live. We are but nothing. And that's how Naomi is defining herself. She rejects the meaning of her name. She is absorbed in her affliction so much that she fails even to appreciate Ruth who was living up to the meaning of your name, the name Ruth means compassionate friend. How God brings things together. So Ruth has lost much, yet she's grateful to find a new home. 
She's grateful to find and explore this God her husband has been always talking about. Now I want to say this. Hating women, hating women, women who are in pain, who are hurting and who can't control their hurts. When a woman's uniqueness is plundered, when a woman's beauty is trashed upon, when a woman's being is looted or ravaged, it can do almost irreparable damage to her and even to those around her. I've, I've come to learn that sometimes it's easy for men to bounce back and get back on the track. But when a woman has been destroyed, there's been cold names, when a woman has been treated like junk, when a woman has been labeled the worst, it destroys her and not only her, but even those who are around her. Every woman needs love. Can I get an amen from the men that are here? It's like as if I'm talking strange language. You see, you, 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 you heard the amen, isn't it? A forced amen. Every woman needs love. Can I get an amen from that? Every woman needs to be respected. Every woman needs love and worth to satisfy your sense of uniqueness. Do you get it? Every woman needs what? Love and worth in order to satisfy a sense of uniqueness. Between a man and a woman, it is woman that really wants to feel that they are unique. They need to be validated almost every single day. That's, that's the truth, isn't it? That's the truth. They need to be validated almost every single day. They need to be told that you are beautiful every single day. They need to be told that you are the one and only every single day. They need to be told you are the queen, you are the champion, you are the maker of this life. There is no any other. <laughs> every single day. I think as I'm saying it, Men are saying, yes, pastor, we understand, but it is tiring. It is a job. I want the women in the church to understand that. Don't think that those words just simply come like cutting butter with a wood knife. It's a job. It's so much work. But yet, it's so important. As I said at the beginning, when a woman... Is clear about yourself when a woman is safe, when a woman is loved, every person that is around is happy. Every married man knows what I'm saying. You want a good meal? <laughs> you want to be treated fairly? Let someone be happy at home. Buy gifts? The attitude changes like that. It's, it's automatically, pa. Just a gift, no matter whatever it is, as long as it is a gift. Because a gift comes with an expression of love, isn't it? Things just changes. But when a woman is bitter, she can fail to see even the intended things that has been there. We see in this in Naomi. Because of her bitterness, because of her frustrations, because of her anger, she even says to her daughters-in-law, go back home. I don't have anyone to give you to marriage. Even if I can have a son today, would you wait for that son? But here's what I want you to understand. There was a practice within the Hebrew people that was known as the Levite marriages, which is commonly practiced amongst African people even today. That if a brother dies... There is always another brother who can marry the wife if the wife chooses so, so that to take care of the wife and to have children within the family. So, so a woman was never let go like that 
She will be given the choices. In my mother's culture, they still practice that. So if a, if a, if a woman's husband dies, they will bring a dish with a cloth and water, and all the men of the clan will sit in a circle. All of them, the uncles, whatever it is, and even those who have been watching and waiting and, and wanting, they all sit in there. She's given the dish with a, uh, a small basin with water, and then she must kneel and, and walk on her knees, the whole circle amongst the men, and the men whom she wants, she must put that basin down to say, can I wash your feet? Can I wash you? And that's a sign to say, can you marry me? <laughs> if she does not want to be married, because her children also are supposed to sit there, she will put the person on her child. If she wants to take care of a small child, who is by right supposed to marry, because they will put even boys of five years of age, because by right they are supposed to marry so if she goes to a boy of five years age and she puts a basin, she simply means to say, I'll take care and raise this son from this day and on. So that practice was also amongst the Hebrew people. That there should be a relative we're supposed to marry. Now, now I want you to know. I think maybe Ruth's husband used to tell her about her, his culture. She got to understand a lot of things. She got to understand a lot of things about God. But then the poor mother-in-law, because of her bitterness, even says to the daughter-in-law, I don't have anyone to give to you in marriage. She even totally forgot that in Bethlehem, there are relatives and there are potential men who could marry this beautiful young woman and have children and have a life. The point I'm trying to make is that that's what bitterness does. It blinds you from every possibility in the future. It makes you not even see things that common sense can see. Do you see what I'm saying this afternoon, men? Women need to be treated with so much care such that there should not be even a door of bitterness and anger and rage and clamor. You may eat that month things that you are not supposed to eat or you have never ate because somebody was so bitter and when they went shopping, they shopped the wrong things. That's what bitterness does. That's what anger does. It makes somebody not function properly. But we thank God for a woman of worth like Ruth who helps her mother-in-law to navigate even through her bitterness and still to go back. As I close this chapter one, things are not yet happening. But we'll ne learn next week that as they get to Bethlehem, the God who works behind the scenes, the bitter Naomi begins to find things differently. You know why? Because no matter how much you are angry, no matter how much you are disappointed, remember what I'm saying and I say again, God does not define you according to present pain. God sees future possibilities. God was working behind the scenes that one day Ruth is going to find a husband and then the whole Davidic line of kings is going to come out of Ruth. Now listen ladies, just keep on reading this book and just get this deeper understanding. Ruth becomes the ancestor of our Lord Jesus Christ. What an honor! But yet she begins very far with an angry and a bitter mother-in-law who does not see the future she believes in a God of the Hebrew people, and she says, your God will be my God, your people will be my people. I want to close by saying this. A wise woman builds a home. What does a wise man do? A wise man builds a woman because she will build him a home. Can I repeat it so that I get an astounding amen? A wise woman builds a home. A wise man builds a woman because she will build him a home. Let's stand up and let's pray together.